The Peter Schiff Show. Well, I recorded my last podcast on the afternoon of April 19th, and I just want to announce that later that evening, my first daughter was born. We named her Lillian Ruth after both of our maternal grandmothers. My grandmother's name was Lillian, and my wife's grandmother's name was Ruth. So we now have Lillian Ruth Schiff. Uh, She was seven pounds, two ounces of pure cuteness. But now I want to talk about what's going on in the markets today, what happened over at the ECB with Mario Draghi. You know, if you just looked at the close in the gold market and the silver market, you wouldn't really know much went on, right? Gold closed up under five bucks, I think four and a half dollars approximately. Silver was up about four cents. But you would know that earlier in the morning, gold was up better than 25 bucks. We did trade back above 1270, not to the 1280. But up at 1270, it's the first time it's been up there in a few weeks. Silver made a new high for the year. Silver was up about 75 cents early in the morning. In fact, I think it made its peak during the Draghi press conference. We were above, I think, 1760. And then just around, I don't know, 9 a.m. or so, there was a huge seller in the gold and the silver market, and the whole complex went negative. Uh, And we managed to close slightly positive on the day, but we had a huge sell-off intraday following a big rally. But look, that doesn't mean the top is in. I think it's interesting. We just got a huge correction out of the way, and the price went up. We, We flushed out a big seller, and now that seller is out of the market, and this market is still going a lot higher. You know, I read an article today. I put it up on my Facebook page, just a mainstream article about how Gold stocks are way up this year, and they are way up this year. But the article basically said, don't buy, because gold's going to sell off, and so don't make the mistake. And I'm seeing a lot of mainstream articles now about why you should not jump on this bandwagon, how dangerous the gold market is. And all this stuff really is music to my ears. If you are a bull, this is exactly what you want. You want everybody to be skeptical. You want everybody to doubt. You want all this worry. Because we want this wall of worry uh, that gold and silver prices are going to climb and we're going to climb with it while everybody else is worried that the market's about to crash because they still don't get it. You know, they're still talking about how the Fed's going to raise rates and how that's bad for gold. It's not bad for gold. It all depends on how they raise rates. If the Fed raises rates Paul Volcker style, really jacks them up there, yeah, that's going to be bad for gold. But they're not going to do that. If they raise rates slowly, which is the only way they're going to raise them, if they even raise them, which I doubt, they're going to be even more slow than Greenspan was. And when Greenspan raised rates, that was great for gold because he was very slow. Well, Yellen is going to be even slower. Yellen is going to make uh, Greenspan look like Volcker. You know, so if gold did well under Greenspan, it's going to do even better under the Yellen hikes if we even get hikes. More likely, we're not even going to get hikes. We're going to get cuts. We're going to get negative rates. We're going to get QE4. So worst case scenario for gold, the Fed raises rates a little bit, and that's bullish for gold. Or they don't raise rates at all, that's even more bullish for gold. Or they cut rates, and gold goes ballistic. So either way, it's going up. Gold stocks, I think, are going up. Yet everybody in the mainstream is sitting there doubting it. They're looking in amazement at the rally, and it wouldn't even dawn on them to participate, which means, you know, this market is moving up, and nobody in mainstream of the investment world, nobody is on board. The train has left. There's nobody on it. So eventually, though, they're going to buy at some point, just like they piled into the gold trade. You know, when it was 17, 18, 1900, that's when the big firms started finally uh, noticing it and jumping on board just before the market turned. Uh, so eventually they're going to realize. I think it's going to take Yellen admitting the economy is weak or the Fed actually cutting rates or something happening. And, but by then, of course, the prices are going to be much, much, much higher than they are now. And we keep getting bad economic news. I'm going to get into the bad economic news that came out today a little later in the podcast, but I want to talk first about the Draghi press conference. Mario Draghi, the ECB 
leaving interest rates unchanged at zero. Of course, they still have uh, negative rates as well. And they, you know, they didn't announce the expansion of their QE program, but they're not tapering it off. They're still doing this huge quantitative easing program. And, you know, the euro initially rallied even during the draggy Q&A. But then when it was over, uh, the euro turned around with the gold market and the euro ended up negative uh, on the day, I believe, or it went negative. I got to check and see if it, if it closed negative or it managed to, uh, to come back positive. Yeah, you know, it basically unchanged on the day. Uh, it was a pretty volatile day. But the interesting thing are some of the comments that Mario Draghi made. One of them had to do with uh, inflation. So Draghi admitted that lower gasoline prices, which of course are not as low as they were, they've been going up, but they're still lower than they were a year ago, right? Two years ago. And Draghi admitted that low gas prices were helping European consumers. It was giving them more purchasing power, and he said it was a good thing. But then in the same uh, conference, he said that they wanted more inflation, that inflation wasn't high enough, but he was confident that they would get it back just below 2%. So which is it? Is it good if prices go down or is it good if prices go up? Because you can't have it both ways. That doesn't make any sense. And why does nobody call Draghi out on the hypocrisy here? Because if lower gas prices are good for the Eurozone, Why does he want to force them to go higher? And if lower gas prices are good for the consumer, why aren't lower food prices good? Why aren't lower rents good? Why aren't lower clothing prices good? Why aren't lower prices in general good? Because if lower gas prices are good because they hope the consumer, well, the consumer spends money on more things than gas. Every price going down helps the consumer. So if that's the case, why does Draghi want more inflation? And again, in that same speech, Draghi says that they are pursuing their mandate of price stability. And then he says, we want prices to go up close to, but not 2%. That's not price stability. The truth is, the Eurozone has price stability right now. Draghi doesn't have to try to achieve price stability. He's already got it. According to what he's saying, inflation is close to zero. It's like a little bit positive. That's stability. Stable prices means they don't go up. They don't go up, they don't go down, they stay the same. What Draghi wants is rising prices. He doesn't want stable prices. He wants to force stable prices to go up. He wants price to go up 2% a year. Now, it's because they've redefined, right? These central bankers have redefined stable to mean going up. And somehow we're supposed to accept that. This is exactly what George Orwell talked about with doublespeak. When you have politicians just changing the meaning of words to fit their purposes, So he has to pretend that he's pursuing their old goal of price stability when in reality he's trying to prevent price stability and force prices to go up by almost 2% per year. Now, another interesting question, somebody asked him about, you know, what did he think about the German criticism of what he was doing? And then he started to say, look, you know, first of all, we're doing the same thing all the other central banks are doing. As if that makes it right. I mean, did little uh, Mario Draghi, when he was a little boy and he, he did something bad, was that his excuse to his parents? Well, all the other kids were doing it, right? My mother, you know, they used to say, well, if your friends jump off a bridge, would you jump off too? Apparently, Mario Draghi would do it uh, because that's what he's doing. So he's justifying his reckless monetary policy because everybody else is reckless. I guess it's just a lot of peer pressure, right? You can't say no when you're a central banker. You have to join join the party. But also, he said, look, you know, the you know, we're we're... Uh, uh, independent. We're we're not going to bow down to uh, criticism from politicians. But it's not just German politicians. It's the Bundesbank. It's German bankers that are upset with what Mario Draghi is doing. But he is ignoring that. And he kept saying, our policies are working. Our policies are working. You just have to give it more time. I mean, give me a break. I mean, how long have they been cutting interest rates in the Eurozone? Now they're negative. When they got to zero, and it's still, they, they still didn't have economic growth, that should have clued them in that it wasn't working. When you have to go from zero to negative, I mean, if that isn't an admission that lower interest rates didn't work because you lowered them down to zero and you still didn't have economic growth, and then you're doing all this quantitative easing and it still isn't there. And, you know, interestingly, one of the Q&A questions, guy asked them, you know, what about savers? You know, you're really hurting the savers and pensioners and insurance companies. And his answer was, look, we want higher interest rates, too. 
But, you know, we can't help it because interest rates just reflect inflation in the economy. And he said we can't have higher interest rates unless we have higher economic growth and more inflation. And so he said, you know, we have to have this stimulus to order to get the inflation and get the economic growth. And then we can have the higher interest rates. So in other words, according to Draghi, the only way to get higher interest rates is to first get lower interest rates. And the lower interest rates will create the economic growth and the inflation that will make higher interest rates possible. Well, first of all, we want real interest rates to be high. What good if interest rates only go up because inflation is going up? The key is to have a positive real rate of interest, not just to you know, be compensated for inflation. But Draghi is half right. And he's not going to create economic growth, but he will create inflation. And that inflation will eventually force interest rates to go up. And that is going to be a huge problem. Because, you know, I'm reading these articles now because commodity prices in general have really started to move up since January, mid-January. All commodities, not just gold and silver. I mean, precious metals are leading the complex. But look at oil is going up. Look at copper. Uh, look at soybeans. You know, look at base metals. I mean, everything's going up. And I'm reading these articles about why this is a good thing, because, hey, this is great. This is what the central bankers want. They want inflation so that they can raise rates. That's the last thing they want is inflation, although the last thing they want is to raise rates. But the absence of inflation, at least in theory, based on these indexes, that's their excuse, right? That's, that, that's what gives them cover not to raise rates is because they can say we have low inflation. The last thing they want is inflation to pick up because then they're out of excuses. Then what are they going to use for an excuse not to raise rates? Because they don't want to raise rates because they can't. At least in America, we can't because we're broke. We can't afford to pay the higher rates. So whatever they say publicly about wanting higher inflation, privately, that's the last thing they want. They're hoping that inflate, they want deflation because then they can really run the pressures. And the reason they want to do that is to prop up these asset bubbles, but more importantly, to monetize the debt of their overly indebted governments. They need to monetize the debt, but they need an excuse. And so the excuse is there's not enough inflation. But then you have guys like Mario Draghi admit that lower oil prices are positive for the uh, Eurozone economy. Well, if lower prices are positive, why do you want to force them to go up? Why do you believe that rising prices are going to hurt the economy except rising gas prices won't? Or you believe that rising prices will help the economy, but you believe that rising gas prices would, would hurt the economy. So, so what's the difference between gasoline and every other product that we buy? So we want low gas prices, but every other price we want to go up. I mean, all this is a bunch of nonsense. But the fact that you now have commodities going up, and I think this is just the beginning. Because now that we have this weak dollar, this is going to really you know, cause this new bull market in commodities. You're going to start to see a pickup in inflation everywhere. I mean, right now in the U.S., right, we already have core CPI, the way the Fed measures it, year over year over 2%. The only thing that's kept the headline number under 2% was the low gas prices and other commodity prices. That's about to change. So now we're going to have the core prices going up and we're going to have the, the headline prices going up. So the Fed's going to have to come up with a whole new level of excuses why they're not raising rates. You know, we got more economic data today, too, that would be problematic for the Fed based on the way they keep reporting things. We got the jobless claims that came out and... The weekly claims dropped to another new low. They dropped 6,000 to 247,000 on, uh, on the week. This is the lowest in over 40 years. Now, of course, the Obama administration and everybody else looks at this as a great sign. Nobody's getting fired. The economy is great. Nobody's getting fired. This doesn't even make sense. I mean, we've had other periods of time in the last 40 some odd years where the unemployment rate has been 5% and we had more people uh, collecting on, or filing for unemployment claims. And the population was a lot smaller. I mean, you go back 30, 40 years ago, there were a lot fewer Americans. So we had a smaller population. Yet today we have fewer people filing for unemployment claims than we did back then. Now, why is that? I mean, is it because today's labor market is just so great? It's like the best labor market uh, in, our, in my lifetime almost. Is that why? No, I, I've mentioned this before. This anomaly should be raising eyebrows. Why are so few people being fired? Because in a healthy job market, more people would be getting fired. There's a lot of turnover in the job market. You know, when you're hiring a lot of people, you're probably firing a lot of people, right? Sometimes you hire people to replace the people that you fire, right? Or you hire somebody and they don't work out and you fire them and hire somebody else. There's a lot of you know, dynamism going on in the markets. There's, there's some churn and it's healthy. 
the fact that we're not seeing the layoffs, I think, is proof that we're not getting the hires. It's the government 200,000 jobs a month numbers that aren't true, because remember, they have no proof that all these jobs were created. A lot of the jobs are just assumed to have been created in the birth death model. And when you have all these economists who believe the economy is really strong, they're just going to assume that businesses are starting up and hiring people, but they have no proof. And the fact that so few people are being fired, to me, is proof that very few people are being hired in the first place. Because if more people were being hired, more people would be, being, would be being fired. That's just the way it goes. So rather than celebrating these low levels of unemployment claims, it should be causing people to question the government's claims that so many people are getting hired in the first place. And again, we've got so much anecdotal evidence of this. We've got government tax receipts, payroll tax receipts that are going down. Uh, we've got the huge support now that you have with Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. Uh, and their messages are the economy is lousy and I can fix it. And they're the ones that are getting the most votes, the people that are acknowledging how bad things are. If things were as great as the president says, people would want four more years of Hillary Clinton. They don't because things are lousy. And more economic data that came out today proves that we got the Philadelphia Fed. This number finally bounced back out of negative territory unexpectedly in March. It got up to 124 and the consensus was that it would be another positive number for April 9. The, 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 the range of expectations went from a low of 5 to a high of 15. No, we got minus 1.6. I mean, they weren't even close. We're back in contraction. A terrible, terrible number. Now we're talking about a second quarter number because now we're talking about uh, uh, April. Also, we got Bloomberg Consumer uh, Comfort Index dropped again from 43.6 to 42.9. That's about as low as that number has been in some time. Leading economic index also came out worse than expected. Last month for February, they told us it was 0.1 positive. They revised it to 0.1 negative. So the same number, just with a minus sign in front of it. And the March number was supposed to be 0.5. Instead, it came in at 0.2. So you've got a weakening, uh, weakening number there. Also, for the Chicago Fed National Activity Index, that was another disappointing number. They revised down the February number, which was originally reported as minus 0.29. They now reported it as minus 0.38. And on top of that, the March number was even bigger minus, minus 0.44. Another bad economic number coming out. So it was a trifecta of negative economic news. Uh, you know, throwing out the jobless claims, which, again, I still look at that as bad news uh, because the fact that such an abnormally few, like low number of people getting fired to me shows that an abnormally low number of people are, in fact, getting hired. So all of this bad economic news coming out today didn't seem to really impact uh, the markets. Nobody really paid attention to it. But the stock market did sell off. And it probably could be under a lot of pressure tomorrow. The Dow was down 113 points. The Nasdaq was only down two points. But it can have a much, much uh, more difficult time tomorrow because after the bell, we got bad earnings from a couple of big companies. Microsoft, which is down, I think, about 3% after hours. It closed at 55.78. It's trading below 54. But Alphabet, which is the parent of Google, that company is getting shellacked, too, by about 4% after hours. They reported weaker than expected earnings. So you've got some bellwether companies now uh, reporting bad earnings. You know who reported good earnings today? Newmont. Newmont came out and beat estimates. The stock was up 5.7% on the day, closing at 32.19. It's a new 52-week high for Newmont. And, of course, most gold stocks were also positive on the day. Even though gold surrendered most of its gains, the gold stocks did not. Uh, the GDX tacked on another 1.8, and the GDXJ, which, you know, the junior miners, that was up another 2.8%. So we're still seeing uh, healthy moves in the gold mining stocks. And I think tomorrow, again, looks like it could be another good day with, uh, you, with stocks coming under pressure from bad earnings. And I think that we made some significant headway today, even though we didn't hold those gains uh, the market still closed positive, and there, who knows who that seller was? There was some big sell order. All of a sudden, massive selling came out. 
billions of dollars short sales or sales uh, in the futures market that came in to hit the markets. But the buyers came back. And I think more buyers are going to be back as more people start to figure out the severity of these problems. They start to figure out that the Federal Reserve has not cured our problems, that the economy has not recovered, that the economy is sicker than ever. Well, the one thing I also wanted to mention that we finally found out from the Treasury Secretary that Harriet Tubman is, in fact, going to make her debut to adorn a U.S. uh, Federal Reserve note. But it is not going to be the ten dollar bill, because initially uh, they were going to they were going to kick off Alexander Hamilton. But there was a big uproar because, you know, they have a a a Grammy winning or Tony winning uh, Broadway show hit show which I haven't seen yet. My wife saw it, Hamilton. And of course, he's become the darling of the left, of the liberals. He was supposedly the good founding father because he was the one that that wanted big government, which, you know, I suppose relative to Thomas Jefferson, yes, he wanted big government. But in reality, he didn't want big government. He wanted small government. Thomas Jefferson just wanted tiny government. None of the founding fathers, including, including Alexander Hamilton, would approve of Social Security, Medicare, Obamacare, food stamps, welfare, any of the stuff we're doing today. I mean, Hamilton, in his wildest dreams of federalism, would he have contemplated something like this? So to try to say that Hamilton would have been in favor of all this big government stuff that we're doing today, I mean, that is a stretch that would have this guy rolling around in his grave. But apparently there was an outcry and they wanted to save him and keep him on the $10 bill. So instead, they're going to kick out slave owning, uh, central bank killing uh, Andy Jackson. He's going off the 20. And so now she's going to be on the 20. But, you know, I was thinking that if you really wanted uh, Harriet Tubman to be on the 10, you know, they're not going to be debuting this until 2020, the year 2020. And I think, based on the amount of inflation we're probably going to have, the $20 bill is going to be the new $10 bill. So having her on the 20 is basically going to be like having her on the 10. And, you know, personally, I think Andy Jackson is happy uh, to get his face off that $20 bill. He probably never wanted to be on there. I mean, if he's looking down, uh, he hated central banks uh, with a passion, and he was probably insulted to have his face on the $20 bill. In fact, I think all the founding fathers, we should take Washington off the one. I don't think George Washington would want to be on that $1 bill. I mean, none of the founding fathers were fans of paper money. So the last thing they'd want to do is have their face on paper money. Because what we're trying to do by putting our founding fathers on our paper money is to try to create confidence and trust, right? Because we all trust You know, our heroes like George Washington and and Thomas Jefferson. Look, Benjamin Franklin is on the hundred. I mean, he would he wasn't he didn't like paper money. But we put these heroes of the revolution on our money to create some confidence that people think, oh, yes, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington. These are honorable, good men and they're on our money. So we can trust it. Well, we're abusing that trust. And I think it would be appreciated by these by anybody uh, to have their face removed. You know, we ought to just put cartoon characters on our money. We ought to make it look like monopoly money. You know, they're all saying, oh, we need to have a woman on our, on our money. So that's why I I thought we should have Caitlyn Jenner on there because Caitlyn Jenner, I Jenner, I guess is as much a woman as our paper money is actual money because it's not, you know, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm I'm not saying this because I don't, you know, sympathize with what Caitlyn Jenner is doing, but apparently she hasn't made the complete transition yet. So technically, you know, she's still a man. Uh, So, it's, she's giving the appearance of being a woman, but technically she's she's not. Well, that's what Federal Reserve notes. They're, they're, it's counterfeit. They're trying to appear to be something that they're not, right? They want you to think that they're real money, but they're not. They're counterfeit. Their IOUs, not, nothing. You know, the original paper money, right? The original $10 bill, the original $20 bill, it was a w- receipt. It said IOU, $20. The bill itself wasn't the $20. It was just evidence that you were owed $20. Who owed it to you? The Federal Reserve. They owed you $20. If you had a Federal Reserve note, that's why they called it a note. A note means that you're, you, somebody owes you something. What was owed? $20. The note wasn't the $20. It said the Federal Reserve had $20. And what was $20? It was an ounce of gold originally, but then we devalued, and then you needed $35 to get an ounce of gold. So you needed a 20, a 10, and a 5. 
But if you had a 20, a 10, and a 5, you go to the Federal Reserve and you got an ounce of gold. Although you couldn't do that if you were an American, but if you were a Frenchman, you can go and you can do it. And, you know, the Frenchmen were doing that. De Gaulle was doing that. That's why Nixon devalued twice and then closed the gold window. But when Federal Reserve notes were legitimate notes, they were promises to pay a, an amount of gold. But now they don't promise to pay anything. They just say this note is legal tender. It's a counterfeit. And so we ought to take off our real heroes and replace them with counterfeits or replace them with cartoon characters. I mean, I, I think even it's an insult to Harriet Tubman. I mean, the things that she did, I mean, she is certainly a very, very uh, worthy uh, historical person. I mean, she had great courage and the things that she did. You know, I'm not saying that she shouldn't be honored. I just don't think it's an honor to be on our currency. So I think maybe we can we can do something else to honor her because I think it's a disgrace uh, to be on our currency, especially when we're about to have a currency crisis, especially when currency is about to collapse. Why would you want to be associated with that? There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is. Truth in Media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award-winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks to truth to power. It's also where you can tune into the Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access to Truth and Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They are all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now, I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com.